Hello. Yeah, very good. I hope it's working. It was Tian Mei. I think I've seen yeah. Tian Mei a little bit. Yeah. Can you see me? Can you see my screen? I can hear you very well. I cannot see you yet on my screen. Huh. Okay. Mm. We can, okay. Now I can see a picture of yours. It's gone. You are back again. Back. That's interesting because when I tested before, and actually yeah. I could have seen myself. Let me just try to enter again. Yeah, Sorry. that's fine. Is this working? No, it's working. Okay. It's working very well. Fantastic. Great. Perfect. Fantastic. Lovely meeting you all. It's 1 a.m. here in the United States. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, Jesus, Mary Christ. <laughs> Jesus, Mary Christ. Huh? And happy Chinese National Day. Happy <laughs> Chinese New Year. Happy yeah. Moon Festival. Happy yeah. Chinese yeah. National yeah. Day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Fantastic. All so right. give okay. us a couple of minutes more. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael... Michael, can you can you hear me? Michael Cheng, can you hear me? I can see some writings of yours. Ah, oh, yeah, Michael. Now, hi everyone. I have to have a light noise. I also have a light noise, but I think it's manageable. Can we try to get Michael on the screen somehow? I'm just waiting for Mrs. Li Xu. Li, are you there? Somewhere? In the off? Oh, just a second. She contacted me just now, but she's talking to me, but she's not. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. So I understand, Michael, you are online already. Can you speak out a bit, whether we can, whether we can hear you and the audience can hear you? Ah, yeah, no, Michael? Okay, then let's give us another another two minutes, and uh, then I try to to change the sequence of the panel a bit. Sure, I think. Ah, this is <laughs> this is Louis Lee Lee. Louis, I'm not sure whether we can manage to get everybody on the screen. No. Number. So let me greet Louis Lee, it's the CEO of Pasic Foundation. It's good we have one person in the audience, apparently. Maybe there are much more we cannot see. <laughs> but you are more than welcome. But you are more than welcome. Then we all love to, we all love to smile at one o'clock uh, at midnight or after midnight. This is really great. Huh? Keep the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ten people are there. Very good. Yeah, very good. Thank you for all the audience who is staying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> excellent. Uh, I, I think we wait a little bit before we start with the panel, but I just want to say good morning from Munich. Uh, I want to say good that you are here. Thank you very much for, 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 for joining our panel on China. 
also see the number of people is growing. This is this is this is fantastic. I know the panelists did a, a really hard work to prepare their their, their, their participations. I I would like to ask a last time around, not to get too late, whether um, Anthony could manage to be to be here with us. Anthony, Anthony yeah, is yeah, here. I'm here I'm Anthony, here. I see. Oh, we also can see you now. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. That's excellent. Then uh, Miss Lee, Mrs. Lee Xu, Lee, can you hear me? All right. Ah, hi, now it's working. Fantastic. Yeah, I have some technical issue here this uh, midnight here. Good. Yeah. Good night. Good morning. Fantastic <laughs> to have you here. Good. Yeah. Fantastic. So, uh, it's only Michael a bit missing. Uh, I'm here. Can you see You're me? here. No, we cannot see you, but we can hear you, which is fantastic. Come on, let's start. Yeah, I think it's great that we get everybody together. It's a real international panel. Fantastic. We are spreading the whole globe. Yeah? We are spreading from uh, Shanghai, Hong Kong... Karachi, Munich here in Europe to the US. This is fantastic. I'm thrilled that all that is, is working. I'm thrilled that I see you. And we have uh, 13 guests in our panel. Uh, welcome. Uh, warm welcome. Good morning. A happy national, national holiday in China, National Day in China, and a very, very happy moon festival. It's really good to have you here. Panelists, the audience, ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to join the Horace's Extraordinary Meeting and our panel session. I sincerely hope that you and your beloved ones are doing well, and I'm happy to see you all passionate spirits and participating. I'm absolutely thrilled about this panel, and I'm thrilled that the technique is running. And thanks a lot to Frank and the Horace's team for getting this, uh, this session together in, 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 really, in really challenging times. My name is Uwe Michel. Uh, I'm, I have the honor to chair this panel this morning, Munich time. I, I worked many years in Asia. I worked in China. I, I lived in Japan, in Singapore, in uh, in India, and I also I also was was working very very closely with EFU EFU in Karachi, yeah, with the Binji family. So also my heart uh, was always with Pakistan. Uh, I'm running now the uh, Asia division of Allianz SE here out of, of, of Munich. And uh, I would love to introduce to our nearly 20 participants now on, on, on the screen and everywhere in the op, our panelists. This is first and foremost Michael Cheng. Michael... Still, we can't see you, but it doesn't matter. Michael is an experienced venture capitalist investor from Shanghai with a special focus on tech firms. One of the prominent investment cases he participated was Alibaba Group. Uh, very well done. I, I wish I would have invested those time in Alibaba. And uh, he uh, helped Alibaba with the IPO in New York 2014. We have Anthony. Anthony, hello. Good to see you. He's based in Hong Kong. He's uh, an active investor, entrepreneur, and a lawyer. Anthony is especially experienced in the investment in sharing economy and humanitarian elements. Welcome, Anthony. Welcome to our panel. We have Jan Mai Chen. Jan yes. Mai, hello. Yeah, good to see hey. you. Uh, we all see that as an impressive young entrepreneur and an active public speaker. She was one of the speakers at the 63rd United Nations Commission on Status of Women. I'm really looking forward to your comments. Thank you very much for being here. Mr. Ikram Sigal, he is joining us in Karachi, he is the chairman of the Payfinder Group in Pakistan and also very knowledgeable on all Chinese topics. He's a senior advisor and director of the CPEC project at the Beijing University. Mr. Seagal, Professor Seagal, thank you very much to have you here in the circle. And last but not least, great to see you. Mrs. Li Xu Lu is a consultant and an entrepreneur specializing in medical devices, renewables, and infrastructure projects. Thank you very much for joining us from, I suppose, New York, isn't it? 
Um, no, I'm back to Houston now. <laughs> now you're fast enough. Back to Houston. I can see it. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> maybe we can have a little selfie together now, uh, just to put it on LinkedIn and send it to Frank, if, if we can do that now. If you're fine with that, I would do it. Yeah. Yeah, please. Go ahead. So show go your ahead. best face and your best smiling. Yeah? Yeah. Go selfie. Okay. Okay, we can use this one, and uh, I'm sure you look. I'm sure you look brilliant. Uh, dear panelists, uh, audience, the past the past month, the worldwide outbreak of COVID-19 has brought the world to a standstill. We all know that substantial damages, uh, hopefully not in your close near and families. A challenging and uncertain time. Every country is trying to reshape its economy. If I look at the, the figures of, of my company, if you look at the figures of my people, uh, the tremendous efforts in China has shown already very, very positive signs. Our figures in China are nearly to post-crisis levels. The impressive recovery is outclassing a lot of countries and regions in the world and making it a heated question which we want to try to answer, at least that we want to participate with in this session, Will China leapfrog in the digital economy post-pandemic? COVID-19 is a catalyst for digitalization, a catalyst for working from home, a, a catalyst uh, for all digital companies. We mentioned already Alibaba. We see JD with a fantastic development in China. There are some countries not fully prepared. However, China's strategy to develop the digital economy can be tracked back long before the COVID-19 outbreak. We want to see what is your view on the, the development in China, what is your view for the next month, for the next years, and what is your view for the international development of China development, its stand within the world economy. And I'm very, very happy to pass the first comment to our panelist, Michael Cheng. Michael, can you go ahead? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Can you hear me okay? Yes, it's very good. It's okay. very good. Uh, I, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, you, Mattel, for setting this up and all your efforts on our behalf. I'd like to thank everyone who's joining the panel. Um, hopefully, it'll be interesting for everyone. Uh, China and its new economy, uh, if we were to look at this year, it's actually been a very good pandemic for China. Uh, right now in Shanghai, people are moving around uh, at levels pre-pandemic. Uh, people are comfortable enough not to wear face masks outside, although they are required in some uh, government buildings and, and uh, mass transportation. But people are pretty relaxed now uh, and feel very comfortable with the government's handling of, of the, the COVID. Um, the government's manufacturing is a V-shaped recovery. Uh, service is almost a V-shaped recovery. Um, and it's not a V-shaped recovery because people are still a little bit uh, reticent to travel abroad and, and you know, make those big purchases. But it's going to be there. Uh, by the end of the year, China will be growing again and probably be the only major economy growing in the whole world. Um, finally, uh, this uh, recession or recovery did not happen with the large amount of liquidity that was used in 2008-2009. China has been fairly restrained on the government side regarding spending. So for the government perspective, and, you know, this is, I say this knowing everyone's saying, well, you know, uh, China's a repressive government and uh, uses tools of control to achieve its goals, which is absolutely true. But from their perspective, the China system works. And the uh, lesson from 2020 is that they need to do more China. Uh, meaning that from the government perspective, they won't feel a need to change at all. 
Um, they feel that they can uh, head off any sort of crisis, uh, meet any sort of challenge with the current system that they have, which, you know, mm-hmm. as we know and we can discuss, that may or may not be true. But that's, I think, the conclusion from the government side from this year. Um, now, looking forward, my comments will relate more to the technology side and the globalization side of, uh, of the Chinese economy, because that's just where I've been and, and uh, what I've been watching. Um, manufacturing has been uh, moving out of China way before 2020, and it certainly will be accelerating, but that, that's sort of an old story. Uh, the new story is that technology-wise, is particularly in semiconductors and very sensitive technology stacks, will deglobalize. Uh, absolutely, will deglobalize. Uh, it will be driven by national security concerns, not by uh, economic concerns. So uh, it will happen. Uh, it will take a long time. Uh, it will not happen overnight. It probably take decades in order for China to recreate the entire technology stack and uh, chip away at the U.S. dominance. Um, uh, but, you know, the, the lesson from uh, the Trump era is that uh, China has to do this or will be always vulnerable to uh, U.S. demands. The other area, uh, just to finish up my comments, is um, that I think will be uh, affected by national security is the financial payment system. Um, the the one area that the U.S. has dominance in, in uh, that's similar to semiconductors, is the SWIFT uh, banking system and the payment system. So that's going to be a national security concern also and will have to be recreated by China in some manner uh, moving forward. Um, what does that mean for the attendees here? Uh, well, as an investor, since I started in this business 25 years ago, it has always been one direction, globalization, and bigger and better markets uh, competing on the world stage. That has turned around completely. And so that paradigm is over. And you have to think about what investments work in certain blocks. Uh, there may be a China block, semiconductor block in the future. There will be certainly a US uh, semiconductor block in the future. So what is that size of that market? And how do you how do you make good investments in that particular area? Uh, it makes it more difficult, but there's certainly opportunities because there's going to be investments made by China that may or may not be necessarily economic in nature, meaning that they won't look for uh, return or profitability. It just has to be done. <clears throat> and finally, as a foreign investor, maybe um, the opening up of the financial payment system in order to compete with SWIFT is a major opportunity for outside investors in China. Okay. Um, if, if uh, you know, I just briefly kind of overview my points. We can we we'll dive into the discussion later. Uh, back to you, Mikhail. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Very very interesting. The the globalization that was driving us all in our uh, the last the last the last twenty years. Will it come to an end? Uh, will it change? Will it be a change in the international supply chains? A very very interesting thinking. The same goes with uh, the security concerns. Thank you very much for the for, for this comment. Thank you very much for these uh, thinking points. Um, Anthony, may I ask you? to follow up here and to go on. Yes. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Michael, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, um, I'm myself more involved in the education sector in China, uh, which has, of course, been affected like many things else uh, under COVID. But um, one of the interesting things about education is uh, in the old days, you know, as you know, China brought a lot of people out of poverty and education was definitely a tool that was used. And as you would know from every textbook that talks about new economies and internet related resources, education is a driving force for that, you know. For one thing, education at least in China, even if it started as a basic level, is now very much multifaceted. It has to be more international. And I think in the future, it will certainly grow more appreciative 
of the problems of the world going back. Okay, in the past it has been a bit more um, uh, localized, if you like, uh, with the Chinese problem. But I think it is inevitable that with the age of the internet, uh, that education needs will change drastically. Uh, certainly, education, as you know, as everyone knows, is an essential tool for economic and uh, social development, um, uh, prom promoting prosperity. But in this age, I think education tools such as technology that people learn will, you know, empower the masses to, if you like, to be prepared for any uh, political and other demands in the world. That is at least what we believe we are seeing in China these days. Um, uh, in the same way as Michael's saying that, you know, um, there are things that are changing all the time in China on the tech front, uh, that tech front also uh, permeates, if you like, uh, the education sector in a big way. Okay. Um, especially these days, and especially, um, I think, in the current climate uh, between various countries in the world, I think we, we cannot uh, divorce ourselves from the reality of the situation. Which is China has to make good its own, um, uh, or not make good, but at least make its own technology, um, be in a position not to rely on others. Okay. Now, as, as you may know, China about three years ago had a master plan. I think that was in July 2017. They had a master plan, um, which, you know, started implementing, uh, if you like, um, technology and AI related, all those buzzwords to do with the new economy um, for children, starting even at the age of three. Um, and as someone who provides, uh, if you like, um, services in the education sector, um, we understand and we see the importance of that every day now. Um, the importance is usually driven, if anything, by parents' demand. You know, one of the crazy, not crazy, but one of the great things about Chinese parents are that they are extremely demanding. And, and, um, and kids... Education is first and foremost, you know, where there's always a deep pocket, okay? And everyone understands and is part of the, you know, is part of the historical and cultural aspects of the Chinese, you know. Plus, there is the usual crowd mentality aspect. If my neighbor's kid has this, why don't we have this? Or why don't we better this? So, so it, is, it is very important uh, for these kids uh, to be uh, educated in the right way. So, uh, for instance, we would develop smart toys and coding, for example, for kids, which we would have never thought of uh, like 10 years ago. And these are, you know, examined and the kids like it and the take up is very smooth, actually. So we see that, you know, the growth in China on the education side is ginormous. Uh, the opportunity or always very uh, very great now what that means is in return you get a situation where uh, there's a lot of profiteering in the education business by I would say corporate um, entities or individual persons who are not otherwise generally uh, in education and in the last a year or so, in the last two years or so, there had been um, uh, measures taken by the government to control, if you like, um, and to limit the investments uh, by, uh, let's say, listed companies or uh, limit the, the growth of um, education institutions that are looking to list elsewhere. Um, and to the extent also that... Um, that there had been rules or directives to try to ban um, the variable interest entity structures, the VIE structures that that um, private educators use to try to get to a listing outside China. Okay, so anyway, 
I think the idea um, is that you know it needs to be controlled in, in the same way as China would control many other industries. And education, because it is an evergreen industry, and it goes to the heart, as you like, of uh, the Chinese culture, the mentality, and growth of the nation, is something that will forever be closely monitored. Okay, so um, I'll 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 I'll. I'll just stop here for the moment. Uh, happy to uh, discuss further. I'll leave it to the next speaker to continue. Okay, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you very much, Anthony. This is very, very inside inside view in the educational system. It gives me again the opportunity to greet all our uh, guests, all the listeners to 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 our panel. We can see uh, your questions. If there's something, if you have a specific question, a specific amendment, a thought to our panelists, feel feel free. Uh, we, we can read that, and uh, the panel will be very very happy to answer and start a discussion with you. Ken May, that gives me the chance to pass over to you, yeah, yeah. and uh, kindly take take the floor. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think I've learned a lot. Actually, I want to cover education, but since Principal Chen has talked about and he's expert, I will just leave that part. And thank you very much, Chairman, and also my dear friend Frank, for um, inviting me to uh, talk about new economy and China after COVID nineteen. Um, Actually, uh, I'd like to introduce myself first. Uh, my name is May. I, I think I'm a bad vegan and a good feminist, meaning I do 80% um, vegetarian and I'm not angry um, feminist. And also, actually, I'm wearing my T-shirt for my brand, Cosmo Citizen. It is one of the largest women empowerment platforms in China. And definitely, we have take advantage of this time of COVID-19 to make the best of it. So today I will cover about four parts. The first part I would like to share with you a little bit information. I know uh, in what we are doing, the background of the new economy in China. And second part is how we've grown so well uh, with the, the support of the technology. And third, uh, let's just look at the industry where I um, in the online education industry. And thirdly, I might just share with you some case studies. So first of all, um, as we all know, we've achieved a tremendous work um, since we have uh, re uh, established New China in a few decades. Um, but however, um, this COVID-19 actually showed the whole world uh, how we can actually fight anything against uh, even it's a novelty as uh, COVID-19. And we set a very good example. Myself actually is from Wuhan. Wuhan is my hometown. And when it just broke out, I was in the United States in West Palm Beach attending a conference. When I was informing everyone about, about the virus, uh, nobody believed in it. There was a business mastery of Tony Robbins. And Tony Robbins literally in front of 1,000 people called me the virus girl. Nobody believed in it. Soon, we closed the whole um, province of Hubei, and not many countries have the ability and, and the vision to do that. So I do believe China, the government set a good example, and the entrepreneurs in the front line set a good example, and our people um, who are willing to sacrifice their time and also their freedom just to stay at home, to cooperate with the government. Also, every single party did a good job. So um, I would like to share with you, um, this is the background. And so at the same time, while we are experiencing all this coronavirus, um, the business, most of uh, the entrepreneurs' business are affected. But at the same time, we are being uh, in, in, uh, innovative. For example, as um, principal mentioned, the online education, because Chinese parents, we, really pay attention to that. We've transferred from offline to online. Just in the beginning of um, 2020, over 10,000 primary schools, uh, 5 million students just um, do their study through Ding Ding uh, app, streaming, um, streaming app through um, the computer. And one of the largest um, education company, New Oriental, they actually start their uh, live streaming system just within one month after the COVID-19 happened. So I am very impressed with the ability to innovate of the Chinese entrepreneurs. 
And also at the same time, with the integrity uh, that they want to devote to the work, the majority of them spend months doing remote working. At the same time, this motivates many uh, companies to uh, boost a new technology or use new uh, tools, such as LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Tencent conference tools. Those were not the popular tools before COVID-19. Now it becomes a norm. So um, I, I believe it, people can see it as a challenge. At the same time, it is opportunity for many of us in China. So, and the third, you can see a lot of um, delivery companies actually, they uh, survived. Um, one of the biggest uh, app delivering fresh vegetables and fruits in China, they actually grow the revenue 350% than they do at the same time in last year. So it is very, very impressive. Number four, we can look at a lot of um, a medical device uh, online, such as Tencent Health, uh, Ali Health, um, um, E Health, Ding Xiao Health. Ding Xiang doctors, etc. Those become extremely successful because people could not go out to see a doctor. They can rely on the doctors online. And it becomes something Chinese uh, get used to. It was not. And lastly, I would like to emphasize the in industry I'm in is online, uh, the, the in internet business. Um, so I I'm not a um, person who use those video app that often such as TikTok, the Chinese version, Douyin, et cetera. And the short video industry, the daily active user increased 16.7% just during the COVID-19. And the daily use length increased 9.3% 9, 9 per day per person. So these are all the good numbers to show um, while many countries complain, the economy is going down, people are losing their job. While in China, we are taking advantage of this to boost the economy, to find jobs for the people, and actually making the economy economy great again. So uh, during this uh, few months' time, half a year, uh, we have something called uh, lazy economy. What does that mean? Lazy economy, uh, you know, first of all, is something you can just um, digest in your scattered time. So you can read a lot of articles online. A lot of bloggers become very popular. Number two is chicken soup economy. So you, some people think, okay, this person can become super successful one night. I can do that too. And then they share the story and then this becomes chicken soup economy. And third is, we call it Zen economy. That means a lot of the Generation Z, Z, they choose to be less, um, um, how do you say, uh, crazy as, as their uh, parents or the previous generation. They, 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 can, they, they have the ability to choose whoever they work for if they do not feel comfortable or if they do not find, find it as a uh, culture fit. So those are the lazy economy. It does not really mean the people are lazy because you have more option at the same time, you have less option, then it makes the companies to work harder to so that they can attract the right people at the same time. So the second part, third part, um, I would like to go through the technology. Uh, why right now it's the best time uh, in China to uh, join the short video um industry it is absolutely the best time ever in history because with the um, wide band um uh 5g and also the famous a b c d e meaning ai blockchain cloud computing data tech edge com edge computing etc um just it is so easy to do live streaming and just in february 2020 the instant app in china the, the total number just peak to uh, 1.2 billion. And short video app, just in one month in February, reach, um, peaked to 9 billion. So this is really a huge increase comparing to the last few years, even though that was increased too. So um, as, as our principal just talked, shared a lot about the background of the education uh, industry in China. And so now is a great time to combine the short video um, 
whether to educate, to entertain, and the education and short video in just in the, in 20, 20, uh, 2020, it reached um, a market size of 600 million um, RMB. It's a growth of 403% at the same time. So it will grow even more in the coming in years. And uh, as we look at the numbers of the daily active users, the app um, numbers, and also the time people spend uh, during the COVID-19. So the active, um, the active daily users spent more than about, uh, at least, uh, three to four hours, uh, on an app on a daily basis, uh, during COVID-19. So you can imagine what kind of habit that they have accumulated during the COVID-19. And certainly at the same time, not the, only the active users, they have learned uh, this is something entertaining. They can also learn something new or can share what they have. Emo it's also an emotion comfort place to go. At the same time, many people become famous through uh, those short video platforms. In February uh, 2020, uh, the famous TikTok Chinese version, Douyin, and the equivalent Kuaishou, their monthly active users is 490 million for Douyin and uh, a TikTok Chinese version, and Kuaishou, the counterpart is 360 million. It, this is just incredible. So um, with with this kind of number, you can just imagine the GMV reaching 11, 11 billion in, in, in years is, is not a difficult um, target. And um, according to a very reliable research center in China, in three years time, this uh, size market will be reaching 100 billion uh, yuan. So if, if there are in the audience, if the entrepreneurs who are in this industry, who are, who are interested to join this industry in China, I highly recommend you to, to join now because look at YouTube. 15 years ago, they just started it. And right now, uh, WeChat, one of the biggest uh, social media um, app in China, they just opened a new platform uh, for short video attached uh, on the app of WeChat. And it's, it's, they just launched a few months ago. So it's a great, great opportunity. And awesome. yes, and lastly, so I just want to mention uh, some case studies. To, uh, if you're interested, just uh, ask more questions. For example, Cosme Citizen, we built in 10 months. And the first time I sold online courses, uh, within one hour, I sold 1.8 million. And within 10 months, we'll reach tens of thousands of Chinese users in 15 countries in five continents including Asia, Europe, America, and Africa, Australia, UK, United States, and Morocco, any countries you can imagine in such a short time. And some of our members, they have really amazing I stories. Uh, one of my clients. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. We're just, just covering a bit of technical issues. I, I understand <laughs> Cosmic Citizens is everything else than a lazy and a zen industry. So thank you very much. Thank you very uh -huh. much for, for that comments. I would... Thank you. I would like to take the chance to to pass now to uh, Professor Sigal Ikram. If uh, if I may ask you, we talked about China, we talked about the U.S., we talked about uh, the the opportunities of, of of internet and digital business. I'm very very happy to pass now to you to see how do you feel in Pakistan, sitting in the middle and being always being the bridge in history. Please. Well, I think uh, I'll stay on the questions because the questions are very clear. The question was how will China's global power grow over the next year? Our next decade of logistic chains are rebound. I think that is important to stay on the question. I'm just going to go quickly back to a little history. Uh, 50 years ago, 50 years ago, uh, almost to the day, I was flying the helicopter that you see uh, behind me. I'm flying it attached to the People's Liberation Army, two divisions that were making the Karakoram Highway at that point of time. Now, uh, this was because the Chinese did not have helicopters at that time. So uh, I was uh, actually ferrying uh, their wounded, their uh, liaison, communication, etc., etc., all the work. 
At that point of time, uh, there was a gentleman who was attached to me as an interpreter, was a gentleman called Mr. Chang. He'd come straight from the language uh, the school out of uh, Beijing University. And uh, one particularly harrowing day uh, when we were sitting there and there was a lot of blood on our overalls because we were carrying this wounded back and forth, uh, who was injured because, they, uh, because of various things. Uh, I asked him, I said, uh, um, why are you doing this? Because to me, uh, Kashgar province was nothing. And, uh, you know, I didn't know what they were going to bring from Kashgar to Pakistan and going to take from Pakistan to, uh, uh, to Kashgar. And I said, you Chinese are stupid. So he looked and looked at me and said, no, you Pakistanis are stupid. You see, you Pakistanis think in terms of 5, 10 years, we Chinese think in 50, 100 years. He says, one day we go down to Karachi. Now, there was no Gwadar at that time. Today, Gwadar is a reality. The road is there. The China-Pakistan Economic Corridor exists. And because of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor and the, and the BRI, there is a new opening. You, you take 45 days from Shanghai to uh, Paris. It takes now 14 days by road and rail. And see the thing. If next, well, in World War II, the Japanese were forced into war because the, uh, uh, the American fleet stopped and the British fleet stopped them from the resources of Southeast Asia. Now, the fifth fleet in the Indian Ocean and the seventh fleet in the Pacific Ocean can go on a rest and recreation tour because they will not be able to interdict the road and railway connection that China has with Europe and Asia. So it's a totally new world. Now, with the opening up of Iran and the China Pakistan Economic Corridor and the 400 miles, 400 miles of sun-swept beaches that Pakistan has at the end of this corridor, Right. And underdeveloped areas. So you have a new frontier. And I think with China is going to develop along this route, whether it's the BRI mostly or the China Pakistan Economic Corridor. Logistically, that was impossible maybe 50 years ago. Today, it is within the realm of possibility. With roads and railways comes industry. And, and the main thing is the economy. If you can build up the economy, Pakistan is a net beneficiary of that economy. Our economy started booming. We had investment for the last uh, 20 years. We never had more than $1 billion worth of investment on an average, maybe 1.5, maybe 1.2, etc. Today, we are getting investment at the rate, because of the China-Pakistan economic corridor, at the rate of $15 billion a year. And this will keep on uh, uh, happening. Now, I had a private security company, my uh, uh, security services division, that's a separate thing. But my real thing is the uh, financial inclusion. 80% of Pakistan's population is unbanked. Now they're unbanked now because of financial inclusion and the, uh, the telephone and, and the internet, it's a, because you don't need the internet for that. They're connecting to the banks. People can open a bank account with, within one minute. Now, can you imagine when 80% of a population of 200 million, that means 160 million people Maybe an adult population, 100, 120 million, have new bank accounts. With the new bank accounts, the economy will boom. The documentation will take place. So I think if you look at it, while Pakistan is a beneficiary, Iran is going to be a beneficiary, uh, Afghanistan is going to be a beneficiary, at the end of the day, China's economic power will grow. And China is going to become a major, major player in the Middle East and North Africa. Because the connections that have taken place, the, the roads and railways that, that have taken place are our bridger of the future to come. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, insightful, very precise, and uh, very coming to the point. I think we see the old soldier in that. Thank you very much. Huh? <laughs> Fantastic. May I, uh, uh, may I pass to, to, to Lee? Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much for patience. And the floor is yours for the last statement. Thank you. Yeah, I think I only have one minute, eight seconds left. So I'll no, be very no, we can we go for 15 minutes more. We started a bit late due to technical issues. Please take your oh. time. Hmm? Okay. Okay. So first, uh, my name is Lee, and um, I'm physically here in Houston, Texas, U.S. today. Uh, I move around a lot. So um, my background is uh, energy. And uh, after I started my business, I entered into medical device space as well. Uh, right now, our business is mainly focused on um, 
um, renewable energies uh, infrastructure. So, you know, and, uh, uh, the gentleman mentioned that the Pakistan corridor, uh, I was pretty active in that region for a short amount of time as well. Uh, it's booming, but it's also with a lot of challenges uh, as well. And then, um, and then for medical device, we focus on helping foreign companies, especially U.S. and Europe companies, go to China market access. So <clears throat> right now the challenge is uh, because COVID, China pretty much shut down store. Uh, you know, within China, it's very active, very booming. However, for foreigners getting in or get out is a challenge. So for both energy and the medical industry, these are long-term relationship-based business. People uh, require a lot of face-to-face -face meetings to get things uh, transactions done. Uh, because we can travel right now, um, a lot of projects uh, are I mean, kind of stopped or shut down because of that reason or slow down. Uh, so in the renewable uh, sector, China is one of the leaders on the renewable infrastructure, um, con uh, EPC construction side, and also manufacturing, um, especially in the emerging market like Africa, uh, Northern Africa, I mean, East Africa especially, um, and then uh, Southeast Asia and Latin America. Uh, all these SOEs these days, they cannot travel or they used to get deal flow or project requests from the local contacts. Right now, they just can't get the projects. And a lot of the uh, due diligence uh, is kind of halfway through. Uh, they don't have the local people to travel to the job site. Uh, let's say uh, a project in Cameroon, typical Dutch SOE have office in Nigeria, and now they just can send a Nigerian into Cameroon and come out. So, you know, things like this happen uh, these days. And then a lot of uh, SOE these days have um, a budget, uh, a big budget, but they cannot spend it uh, because they cannot travel. Uh, so for us, Leisure International, we basically connect with the overseas projects and the Chinese capital um, in the past. And now we're trying to save these uh, projects, especially the uh, halfway down projects and the China funding is kind of stopped and will help them redirect to uh, European capital or the Japanese capital. Uh, so continue the pro project. And as the other thing is, um, at the moment, at least based on what we heard from the market, um, the Belt Road initiative, initiative has a lot of challenge, like say uh, the unpaid debt. Uh, so there's possibility to cut down the funding, uh, at least in the, in the near future. So what that means is the power in those regions potentially is going to reduce slightly. Uh, in the long run, I'm sure, you know, things are going to be back again. Um, and then, but in the moment, I think it's going to be a little bit reduced. Uh, on the medical device side, China is uh, five times the U.S. or Europe market. So it's always a big, um, you know, go-to marketplace, especially for European companies, even for small U.S. companies as well, because U.S. market is very difficult to, to conquer. Um, and then uh, these are the uh, the areas companies tend to, you know, do face by face and many multiple visits to get things done. And now, of course, is also a challenge. So we work with many uh, international majors uh, in China and their challenge is they cannot find the, the technology because they cannot travel. So uh, at, uh, at, at the moment, we just act as bridge between the US and the European companies and the Chinese um, um, strategics help them to uh, connect with the technology and the market. Uh, but I know uh, there are many companies that are struggling right now. They, you know, they can't get out, can't get in. Um, again, that's just temporary. Well, hopefully a year later, uh, things back to normal. Uh, and then both China side and the Euro uh, Europe and the US side, healthcare is a big market. So we're going to um, see a, a increased investment in uh, both sides. I think that's kind of a summary, I mean, quick uh, summary of what, what we see in the market these days. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Very, very, very interesting. Healthcare, undoubtedly, healthcare is one of the uh, of the really important things. One of one of the futures. I really thank you, thank you for your insights. Um, for the sake of time, and I think we all want to listen to uh, Antonio Guterres in, in in thirty minutes. So you really have the privilege to speak in front of the uh, chairman of the United Nations. It's fantastic. I. I, I would like to get a, a second round, but a very, very quick round. And the really important things you can say in one or two sentences. I have 
I uh, really would like to, to, to share and to grab your, to grab your wisdom on, on, on two issues and two questions. When do you think we can back to a certain normal, meaning when can we meet in person, which is very important for our business and all for our social context? Will it be six months, 12 months, or 24 months? A very easy answer. And uh, the second one, I'm very happy to give you three, four sentences on that, but please not more for the sake of time. What will be what will be different then? What will what will the pandemic significantly change in our lives, in our economic lives, and in the world going forward? So six, twelve, twenty-four months, two, three, two, three things. What will be different? And uh, maybe we keep the sequence and we start with Michael. Michael, please. Uh, I'm mute. I'm mute. Uh, Sorry about that. Thank you, Sorry Michael. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, my answer is six months. Uh, mm -hmm. The reason is that um, we are in the last stages uh, before we're getting a vaccine. Uh, my friends are getting the vaccine here in China, uh, and it will be open to the public probably in November. Um, the world uh, doesn't need 70% herd immunity because there's 20% of the people that see everyone, as you know, 20% of the people do 80% of the networking. So we, we need to get those 20% uh, immunized and then we'll be, you know, the half, the battle will be halfway won. Uh, your, your other question, I, I'm optimistic. I think that we can get back to normal, um, but there will be some uh, behavior change, especially in China where it's always been handshake culture. Um, mm. We don't discuss until we actually meet And I think, uh, and China culture-wise is a very community culture. You know, even uh, chopsticks are not, um, you know, not individual. It's shared uh, food. So it's, it's never been a culture that's been separated for anything. Uh, it may change uh, a bit in, in, in terms of the uh, business realm, um, but I'm hopeful that we'll, we'll get close to normal. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Anthony? Yeah, I think I, I second, uh, second what um, uh, Michael says. I think, you know, I, I just give you a, a little story. You know, when we started investing, between our, us investors, we have a golden rule. We have to meet and greet whoever we invest in. Well, that rule has gone since gone out of the window. So, so but, but I think it's still very difficult. I think it's very difficult to do business without meeting. Uh, hmm. I'll just leave it at that because I, otherwise it's a crystal ball gazing in terms of what happens in six months. I, I, I don't know the answer, <laughs> frankly. Fair Thank enough. you. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Can May, fast and crispy. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Chairman. Thank, Thank you. Um, I, I do believe for China where they start now, um, our office is opening and people are back into the business. But in the rest of the world, I would say at least six months and more. And what will be different after COVID-19, I believe the most important thing is people's mindset. Definitely they will change. Uh, they value their friends more. They value the human touch, human connection more. And number one, number two, I think is um, their personal health. In the past, you could just, um, you know, go to work and come back home to meet. Right now, if you stay all the time in one place, you actually need to need the health body. And lastly, I think it's also um, the soul, so the mind and the physical body and the soul. I, I think it is the time for people to realize that mindful living is important instead of only talking about economy first. If people really take, um, take care of these three parts, I think economy will be even Uh, back over because actually people realize in the end of the day, we make everything happen because we want humanity and happiness and everything. Let's create a new earth after COVID-19. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. You come, please. I think, uh, first of all, I think uh, you're being optimistic because when you think there's only six months. Okay. I think the second wave coming in and a number of cases. I think, and you know, the vaccine not being available everywhere. 
may be available in China, but not available all over the world everywhere. I think more towards nine nine months uh, to even more uh, to a year. Mm -hmm. I think the person is working on that. Number one. Number two, I think, like you said, you know, so some things everybody is saying that a bit of the culture will change. Like in Pakistan, we like to embrace each other. I mean, more, more than, more than, uh, uh, you know, more than shaking hands, we embrace each other. You know, uh, that's the form of greeting. I think that will go back to you know people putting their hands on the heart. That's become the new norm. You know, people put their hands on the heart. That's the new norm of greeting people. I think that the culture will change there. I think uh, virtual meetings will come become more known. Physical meetings become less. I think people will tend to wear masks more, even with, mm. even after the uh, pandemic is over. I think, mm. I, think I, I think a lot of culture will change. I think people have got used to staying alone. People have used to got, you know, uh, uh, not in big crowds. I think a lot of that will change. May not change uh, in the in the strata that you have the big population because in Pakistan you never had that widespread pandemic uh, that you had in other countries, and we managed to control it. I think that gives a false sense of the thing. But I think the society itself, there will be culture changes, uh, which will be more, will become more and more strong as we go along. Hmm. Thank you very much. And last but not least, always. <laughs> okay. So uh, I hear, uh, since I'm in the medical uh, device business, so I uh, definitely have a little bit more insights um, uh, than a lot of people. Uh, there's different versions. There are six months version, uh, a year version, two year, two years version. Uh, personally, I think uh, it doesn't, I mean, at a global space, yes, there are different versions. However, for individual business owner or individual you know, uh, professionals, it's your personal choice. Uh, number one, you know, protect yourself, and then number two, get business down. So uh, I, myself is considered, you know, road warrior. So a lot of my business partners, which a lot of them already start traveling. Um, so I guess it's personal choice. Like uh, you know, uh, Michael says, it's always twenty percent, eighty percent rule. Uh, some of them are getting on road much earlier than others. Uh, despite the, the uh, vaccine or, uh, or, or you know COVID situation, um, and then uh, so that's um, on my on the question number one. Question number two, um, I think you know in general the the way we work is going to be um, changed slightly. More digitalization, uh, more work from home, uh, more remote meeting, Zoom calls like this. Uh, online business is booming. Uh, however, the fundamental part, like say when you make a big investment decision, make, when you sign a big deal, there's always a re required some kind of personal meetings. Uh, that part I don't see go away. Um, so, um, so I will I say it's going to be um, uh, the things should happen, gets accelerated uh, um, uh, mm. progress. However, nothing major changes. That's my personal opinion. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your insight. Thank you very much for your time at night, early in the morning. Fantastic. Thank you for answering the questions from the audience. So you're really multitasking in all respect. It was my pleasure. I would be extremely happy to meet you in one of the other Horizons meeting. Um, if you can manage next year in 12 months, the big meeting in Portugal, I think we are happy and we could be, um, and we could be happy on that. Thanks a lot for your time. Thanks, Horasis, for arranging. I was really thrilled about the insights. I uh, wish you a very, very good day with Horasis. Interesting discussions. And thanks a lot. Yeah? Auf Wiedersehen from Munich. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.